Got it. All right. Well, thank you uh, for everyone joining us today. Uh, my name is Tim Davis. Um, I'm with uh, Deloitte and I lead our global center of excellence for blockchain assurance. Um, so in that role, we work with clients around the world uh, in terms of assessing uh, risks and helping implement uh, controls that are necessary for offering assurance over blockchain and digital assets. Um, our conversation today is uh, on on-chain risk monitoring. Um, and I'm joined by two great panelists. Um, and uh, it's Lucas Nuzzi, who's the head of network data from CoinMetrics, and Hurt Jap Glassbergen, who is a software developer working with MIT's Digital Currency Initiative. Uh, and they're going to help me explore this topic. So with that, um, up on the slide here, we've got the framing for the discussion. And let me just sort of walk you through this. What this is, is our view of how enterprises should be thinking about. It's one possible way. It's a way we think is helpful in evaluating blockchain-related risks. Um, and just to sort of talk you through it, so we see three layers, uh, obviously the infrastructure layer, uh, the blockchain layer itself um, that sits on that infrastructure layer, and then the transaction layer above that, which is really the individual transactions that would be on the blockchain. Each of those layers have certain dependencies, obviously, on the layer beneath them. Um, across the top, we see certain risks that are uh, implicit to the organization itself. Uh, that the organization would have to take responsibility for. There are certain risks that are on-chain risks, and this is what we're going to focus on today as part of our discussion, is what's in that red box, uh, which is really looking at <clears throat> what are the, the risks that are on-chain that can be monitored on-chain, and how should enterprises be thinking about what types of risks they should be looking to monitor um, and then finally, there are certain off-chain risks that um, there are a couple of examples here on the slide of what those are. Uh, and they're going to be specific to each blockchain and the use cases involved. Um, but without going into too much detail, at the end of the day, really all of these uh, sort of nine intersections uh, really should be populated by the enterprise and the enterprise really should have responses for, for each of these. Um, so with that, I'm just going to dive into this red box here. Um, and here's a couple of examples that we've got of some of the risks uh, at the transaction layer. Um, so the transaction layer, as I said, is really the data that's on the blockchain. And the types of risks that we think about uh, there are, for instance, if you were to see significant or unexpected market movement, right? that's obviously got to do with the data itself, you'd want to understand that. A new unauthorized or unusual transaction activity that might potentially represent unauthorized. It could represent AML related risks that you need to be responding to, possibly double spend attacks. Um, and then possibly the use of privacy features. So obviously if you're dealing with um, any sort of uh, asset that might have privacy features, um, some of those might be fine. Some of them might actually be problematic and actually may create uh, AML and other regulatory uh, issues. So you might want to be monitoring for that at the transaction layer. Um, but you also may want to understand it from an auditability perspective that uh, for your own ability to reconcile to the blockchain and your own books, books and records, uh, privacy features can create a problem. Uh, obviously, the, you know, there are a number of service providers that are offering insights at the transaction layer, and they offer forensic services, analysis services. These are just an example of some of the risks uh, that are uh, at the transaction layer. And at the blockchain layer, um, this really relates to the health and reliability of the underlying blockchain. Um, so it could be the degree of consensus, unexpected delays in block confirmations, Obviously, if you are working with a, a deterministic chain, um, each will have its own sort of fail point. Um, of, uh, many of them have a 33% fail uh, failure point. Um, and, you know, you would obviously want to have a mechanism in place that monitors that uh, well before it got to 33%. But whatever that threshold is, it would be important that you have some 
expectation of what you're willing to tolerate in terms of just normal operation of the chain and what you shouldn't shouldn't be tolerating and actually then having some sort of escalation and uh, agreeing on what that playbook is in terms of if if the chain starts to exhibit um, unnatural levels of um, behavior, what is it as an organization that you would do? Obviously, it's very different if you're in a permission blockchain environment because then you would typically be in contact with the blockchain administrator to understand what they're seeing and what they're doing in terms of, uh, you know, uh, diagnosing and responding to the uh, unexpected activity. In a permission environment, you know, you you um, on your own in terms of, you know, making that decision on what it is that you feel like you want to do. Um, so on the rest of the blockchain layer here, just a couple of other uh, risks um, that we came up with, and, and there are almost for sure more, uh, but our panelists will get into some of these in terms of the work that they've done. So um, selfish or manipulative mining practices, um, possible protocol amendments, um, some which might have been expected. You want to make sure that they've seem to have applied themselves as expected. Some may not have been expected. Um, you know, you're looking at the sufficient number and the apparent distribution of arm's length validator nodes, obviously, it's not typically perfect insight into that in most blockchain systems, uh, but you'd have to evaluate how important that is to your particular uh, use of the particular blockchain. Um, and then just a couple of other examples like reorganization anomalies that might be apparent on the chain and forks um, that, uh, that occur. So um, these are just examples, um, but I think the point is, is that uh, in order for the blockchains to mature, uh, we believe that this uh, level of sort of insight and the services available on chains also need to mat uh, mature. Um, and, you know, so today it's really up to the enterprise to sort of figure out how they get comfortable with the risks. I think as the ind industry matures, we will start to see service providers emerge that are actually providing uh, this type of data and also uh, blockchains that actually facilitate the provision of these types of investments. Because we to get this type of information. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Hurt Jap, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the research and work that he's done with uh, the Digital Currency Initiative. So Hurt Jap, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, I think uh, one of the things that we're spending quite a chunk of time on uh, at the DCI is um, uh, looking at various aspects of proof of work because um, uh, what we've realized, and I think more people are starting to realize, is that even though proof of work is now like over 10 years old, Bitcoin obviously introduced proof of work consensus for cryptocurrencies. Um, but even now that it's 10 years old, there's much to learn about it. And uh, this includes things uh, related to consensus risk that Tim was talking about. So one of the things that we're currently doing is we started a project um, uh, called the Reorg Tracker. Uh, and this is work done by uh, James Lovejoy, who recently graduated with his master thesis on this topic. Um, and what the Reorg Tracker does is it actively monitors proof of work chains for uh, chain reorganizations and double spends. And uh, the reason that you have to actively monitor this is that uh, chain reorganizations are transient. So you need to monitor this actively to observe them. If you switch on your full node after the fact, then you won't even know that there was a reorganization. So you'll miss uh, that fact. So we have to actively monitor the chain. Uh, another thing, uh, if nobody notices reorgs, then it means that attackers or victims uh, will have to reveal the fact that these things happened, uh, like out of, um, uh, by themselves. They will have to come forward and say, look, I was 51% attacked. Um, and, and, and money was double spent, stolen from me. Um, and I think the idea behind it is also to demonstrate that 51% attacks, while we haven't seen them happen on Bitcoin, there's a bunch of other proof of work uh, blockchains where they do happen. And it means that 51% attacks are a real risk. They're a threat to um, uh, proof of work blockchains. Um, and it's important to understand what, like why they happen, how could you detect them before they happen? Because the thing with the reorg tracker is even though it's 
very interesting to learn what kind of double spends and um, chain reorganizations happened. They're detected after the fact. So the damage is done at the time that you detect them. And so it would be very interesting to understand how these attacks are facilitated and whether or not there are indicators that you can use to detect these attacks before they happen. Um, and to that effect, one of the things that we're also looking at in the project around the reorg tracker is to look at um, uh, hash rental markets. So what we've observed is that um, the 51% attacks that we've spotted in the wild happened on uh, cryptocurrencies with a liquid hash rate rental market, meaning that um, you can easily rent hash rate on an open market to perform the attack. Uh, and there's marketplaces like hash that allow you to do this without any upfront investment. And that's uh, something uh, that people start to realize now that the um, uh, the attackability of a chain is dependent on how much hash rate is for rent and not necessarily uh, on the attacker's desire to accumulate a lot of hardware that's no longer necessary. There's not really uh, a capital expense to perform this attack. It's only uh, a time-limited rental of the, um, of the hash rate in order to perform the attack. And what, what we've noticed is that hash rental price um, happens during the period where we also observed 51% attacks. So if we looked at 51% attacks happen, then the algorithm used by the proof of work blockchain that was attacked had a higher price during the attack than they did in the normal um, market conditions. So this could be an indicator that um, increased rental price means that an attack is imminent. This is not 100%. So one of the things that I'm working on myself is a system that we called uh, the pool detective, where we are monitoring uh, the work that uh, proof of work mining pools sent to miners. So this system positions itself uh, between our own mining hardware and um, uh, around 50 uh, mining pools on uh, 11 cryptocurrencies. And we monitor what these mining pools are instructing our miner to do. And one of these mining pools is actually the hash rental market because the hash rental market is also a mining pool. And by monitoring what these mining pools ask the miners to do, uh, you can detect whether they are behaving appropriately um, within the system. So what you expect a mining pool to do is to uh, give its workers um, the, the work to extend the currently longest blockchain. Uh, but what we've observed is that there are, uh, for instance, uh, in the case of hash rental markets, the work that you can observe could be the work for a private fork. So the work that you're getting doesn't match any of the publicly available blocks, meaning that you can, um, you can increase the potential risk uh, assessment on an attack being imminent uh, at that time. And so this is also a potential uh, early warning system. And uh, the project around uh, the pool detective originated from the realization that uh, mining pools have a large degree of control over what these individual miners are working on. And given that uh, the eight largest pools control 75% of the network hash rate on Bitcoin, for instance, that's a very small population that controls a very large amount uh, of the uh, hash rate that are, that, that's contributing to consensus um, and therefore, uh, it's important that somebody, and currently we're doing that, um, is, is monitoring what these miners instruct, uh, what these mining instruct the miners to do, because the, the mining hardware isn't capable of distinguishing whether the work is uh, valid or not. Um, and so, we think that monitoring the mining pools and monitoring the uh, hash rental markets could help as an early warning for imminent consensus problems because uh, privately mined forks through hash rental markets would be detectable uh, 
privately mined forks by mining pools. We haven't observed those. If it happen, they should be detectable as well through this system. So the only risk that's left uncovered would be privately mined forks by individual miners or by private pool we can monitor. But it's currently a very low percentage of, at least for Bitcoin, a low percentage of the hash rate. Um, so the amount of hash rate that you can monitor this way uh, can be seen as like if you if you cover enough percentage of the network hash rate, uh, then the part that's left is at least incapable of doing some of the attacks. Like if it's not the majority, then they cannot, for instance, perform a 51% attack. And the last work uh, done by the DCI that's noteworthy in this context is uh, work done by the DCI together with uh, Dan Morose from Harvard and Daniel Aronoff from uh, MIT Economics around a concept called counterattacks. So even if you observe an attack after the fact, um, in a liquid hash rental market where you can rent enough hash power to perform an attack, you can also rent that same hash power to counterattack. And if you counterattack, that means that um, a chain reorganization that happened can be reversed by extending the chain that was orphaned from the network and making it the longest chain again by mining on it. It would restore the original chain and reverse whatever double spend happened. And while the reorg tracker was tracking uh, Bitcoin gold, it in fact detected one of these counterattack scenarios where an attacker uh, made an alternate fork, uh, did a double spend, and then uh, uh, sometime later, the original chain was extended again to, uh, to be longer than the attacker chain. And this went back and forth a few times until the attacker uh, gave up. And uh, the conclusion that the paper draws, or one of the conclusions that it draws, is that in the eye of a potential counterattack, the attacker shouldn't attack to begin with. Uh, because where originally attacking could happen at um, a fairly low cost, because all the hash rate was available for rent and was only needed for a short period of time, um, the fact that there's a risk of a counterattack means that the risk for the attacker goes up as well, that his attack fails. Um, but the thing is that there are currently no ready-to-deploy counterattack systems available that would allow us to deploy this in practice and see uh, whether this actually deters attacks or, uh, or not. Um, but we have seen these counterattacks in the wild, meaning that the system is feasible. Uh, somebody was able to do this. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, I think the conclusion uh, of, of most of this work is that um, uh, a proof of work is being studied for, for years and years and we still learn new things. And so also mapping that to uh, other consensus algorithms that don't have the problems that proof of work has, and Tim already uh, mentioned this, is that other uh, consensus mechanisms might have different problems. They don't have the same problems as proof of work and 51% attacks and scenarios like that. But I think it's important to study all these, all these consensus mechanism in depth uh, to understand what the risks around these consensus algorithms really are. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's it for me. So um, let's, go over to, uh, let's go over to Lucas. Great, thanks, uh, Gertjap. So the point on proof of work and Nakamoto consensus being, you know, 10 years old, and we're just now understanding these uh, potential remediation techniques is, I think, very valid. Um, we've always understood that there's, there are problems with the transaction layer with, for example, um, exchanges as custodians of, of or on the behalf of users, um, having suffered severe hacks, uh, even as early as last year with Binance losing 
you know, dozens of, of, of millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin after their hot wallets was pretty much drained. So I think we, the, the issue um, that uh, third parties that a lot of times hold the keys to the kingdom and, and are single points of failure, uh, not understanding potential problems with both the blockchain layer, if withdrawals, for example, are in a stale block and that block doesn't become part of the best blockchain and you have withdrawals in that block. Uh, a lot of exchanges don't know how to deal with that. And it was very clear in 2017 as fees spiked and there were withdrawals that could not just be processed, right? So there are several risk factors that I think were understood because of precedent, but I think work by the DCI, uh, by you, Gurjap, and, and James Lovejoy, really highlights the, the fact that there are remediation techniques that can be used by these exchanges to better understand risk in general. And Coinmetrics has always done work on uh, metrics for research purposes and for alpha generation purposes for funds but we're now um, also pursuing uh, metrics that help these third parties manage risks, both at the blockchain layer for things that might be happening at the network as a whole, but also the transaction layer for specific uh, assets that the third party holds and uh, things that might be affecting those specific uh, UTXOs or those specific addresses. So, in terms of uh, alerts, I, I could give some examples of things that we're looking at as of right now. Um, for example, one of the that we're tracking is the number of blocks at the chain tip. So as a feature of Nakamoto consensus, there are situations where there are two competing blocks at the same height, right? So there are two blocks that are valid that have occurred at the same time. And uh, this is called, a, there, there are two stale block candidates, right? And once a block is mined on top of one of these two, the situation is resolved and the transactions um, of one of these blocks is gonna process, whereas the others are not gonna process. And the majority of time, the composition of transactions between those, apart from the Coinbase transaction that pays miners for, um, you know, finding the, the golden nonce. But there are times where they're not. We found instances where um, there are transactions that were not uh, equal. So if you're an exchange and you have a withdrawal and that withdrawal is in a stale branch that did not make it after the stale block candidates were um, rearranged and resolved, you as an exchange, you need to take steps to make sure that those transactions that didn't make it um, are actually uh, included in the next block. Same thing with deposits, right? So if you have deposits that ended up belonging to a steel block, you have to make sure that this rule of, you know, you, you're going to wait three block confirmations, uh, then becomes four block confirmations. Um, because now you're going to have to uh, ask users to redeposit those funds or um, RBF those funds. Um, and for Bitcoin, that's not, a terrible issue thus far, given that, um, you know, still blocks are quite infrequent. Reorgs deeper than one block are very infrequent. But for other assets, uh, it is a little bit more of a, a recurring issue. So number of blocks at the chain tip is, is one of the, the alerts that we're tracking. Uh, and that's more relevant to the transaction layer um, and, and, and the blockchain layer because it's, a, it's an event that's happening throughout the network. We're also tracking uh, inflation. So there have been updates in the past for Bitcoin and for nearly you know, most other protocols that introduced an inflation bug. And uh, we count the number of assets outstanding on a rolling basis to see hidden inflation that might affect or trigger a reorg in a network. Um, we are also starting to do work on uh, mining pools, also inspired by um, the work of, of the DCI.
Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure My if you voice. can hear it, Jeff. Yeah, we, we lost you there for a little bit, Lucas, I think. Sorry about that. Uh, I was just saying that, uh, so for certain transactions, you might want to see um, which transactions miners are working on. And like Gurdjieff said, uh, be able to do that before they get, tr they, they get confirmed. Uh, and there are ways of doing that by connecting to various mining pools, deserializing the transactions being relayed via stratum, and essentially be able to um, infer block composition before a block even confirms. And the natural evolution of this work will be um, counterattacks uh, and, and products that can facilitate counterattacks. Um, and there's basically two ways of doing this. Um, one, like Gertrude mentioned, is through mining. So tracking these uh, mining markets, be it you know nice hash, uh, miner gates um, that are emerging now that inventory of highly specialized you know ASICs for uh, algorithms that are niche, um, as those used in, in Berkwine as an example, um, are starting to develop. One of the potential counterattacks te te techniques is uh, through uh, rental marketplaces. So um, it is essentially a technique to try and reorg yourself uh, by renting mining power and uh, doing that work where if you're an exchange and you've been hacked, within those six block confirmations that the network is, is expecting to be, you know, considered final, which in itself is, is the you know, well stick that says the six block confirmations um, uh, is, is, you know, perfect. Reality is probably less than that. But through mining, you could potentially, within those six blocks, alter a transaction where, say, your hot wallet has been drained. Uh, so that's one of the approaches through mining. Another interesting counterattack technique that uh, we're also exploring, uh, you know, in the context of a product, is the uh, construction of transactions that, via you know, crypto economic mechanisms, uh, can it in itself incentivize miners to um, potentially uh, accept a, a double spend that would benefit them. Um, uh, you know, economically. So, for example, with the both with the Bitfinex hack in 2016 and the Binance hack of last year, there were talks about um, potentially using um, Nakamoto consensus intrinsic uh, capabilities of, of reorganizing to accept a version of the chain where those where the hack did not take place, and it's problematic. Uh, when you started start to talk about it within um, in you know, a hundred block. Uh, Sorry, Lucas, we've lost you again. Sorry, Lucas, I don't think we can hear you. And oh, there you go. You're back again. Yeah, like I was saying, um, which could affect the confidence in the network um, considerably. But if you have highly performant ways of tracking the mempool and you can decrease the, 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 the time to respond to an incident where your hot wallet has been drained from 100 blocks to the mempool, um, and you can do that purely with crypto economic incentives, let's say, for example, you have a UTXO sitting around and your hot wallet has been drained and you reconstruct a, a transaction that essentially tells miners, hey, I've been hacked. Uh, please revert uh, these two UTXOs that went to attacker's uh, wallet back to this, this address. And if you do that, um, I will give you uh, or you plus the next five miners um, an arbitrary large amount of Bitcoin. And so in a lot of ways, I think this will increase the security overall because like Gertrude mentioned, it, it is the equivalent, I, I like to say, uh, and I, I didn't come up with this analogy, but it's the equivalent of the ADT sign uh, at, at outside of your house uh, where uh, an ADT in the US is a, is a security company that protects, uh, has an alarming system. 
Um, but it's basically a guarantee that if you're if you're an attacker, there are incentives there not to attack um, because you might be facing some um, potential retaliation. So with that, you know, heading back to Tim. Um, um, yeah, thanks, Lucas. I mean, it's fascinating. Probably go on for a lot longer. I mean, we've got a couple of minutes left, but I, one maybe final question is just <clears throat> some of the difficulties that you both experience in terms of actually getting this data, because it's not even in the Bitcoin blockchain, not oftentimes easily or readily available. And, and as we think about, you know, the evolution of blockchains in general, um, I, I would say oftentimes it doesn't appear to be a key design consideration is making available data that participants need to have access to if they're going to do a good job of actually monitoring their interests relative to the chain. So maybe you just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. I, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. So um, uh, we had to um, essentially become a miner, record what we're seeing in order to understand what these pools are working on. And similarly, I think, um, uh, like for instance, there, there's been debates about uh, like exchanges being able to prove that they're um, uh, solvent, for instance, because that's also something that's, that's really, well, like the, the exchange knows, but we like there's no proof for us to, to trust. And similarly, uh, what mining pools do, like we have to listen in and and assume that they're treating us the same way as all the other miners. Uh, but uh, for instance, there's there there's no way for us to determine whether the pool uh, pays all its miners correctly. The only person that knows that is the pool operator. Um, and so, um, like I'm I'm not sure if it's unwillingness to be transparent or there are not being systems for them to easily deploy and become transparent. I think um, it has to be a collaboration between the industry and people who know uh, about, you know, these kind of systems to, to prove what they're doing, uh, whether or not it's possible for uh, standardization in saying, okay, well, if you want to know what a mining pool is working on, here's like the the standardized stream that you can read out where you can see what's going on a similar like an exchange here is a standardized way to prove that we're solvent and i think as these as the systems mature and as these systems become available um i would be surprised if none of the exchanges are willing to participate in systems like this uh, and eventually the ones who will become the preference way of doing business, I would say. And I hope that uh, the interest of the other ones to follow. Yeah. Lucas, anything you'd add on that? Yeah, it does require sourcing data via very um, unorthodox uh, methods. Uh, so in, in addition to connecting to mining pools and, and having to become miners, uh, there are other ways no, sorry, Lucas, I think we've lost you again. Sorry, Lucas, we've lost your audio. Versions of uh, a client in different geographical locations uh, with different configurations so that you're maximizing for connectivity. So it's definitely a non trivial effort to, to uh, attain that information, but hopefully uh, the benefits are, are tangible and, and uh, it's something that is justify, uh, you know, that extra work. Okay, super. Uh, we lost your audio for a little bit there, but hopefully the production engineers might be able to patch that back in when they get to production, we'll, we'll have to see. But anyway, let's close with that just to stay on time. Thank you so much, Lucas and her chat for your contributions, fascinating topic. So with that, thanks very much, and um, we'll close the panel. Thank you.